Harlow. Harlow. Harlow.
Good evening. This is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, <coughs> VK3 EKH, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, with the regular Friday night broadcast coming to you from the studios of VK3 CSJ in Narry Warren South. This is VK3 EKH ASV Radio, broadcasting on prime frequency of 3541 kHz in the 80 metre amateur radio band. Simulcasting on 160 meters AM on 1865 kilohertz and broadcasting via the Melbourne TV repeater VK3RTV digital channel 1 and also via the YouTube, YouTube stream, the video stream on YouTube uh, which you can find by typing in VK3CSJ in the YouTube search engine. Uh, welcome to this session of the ASV Radio broadcast session for this 17th of June 2020. A very pleasant good evening to everybody tuning in on, at the time at 10 o'clock and uh, and uh, going to hang in there for the next hour or so and listen to me waffle on. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I trust everybody is okay. And a good day to Daz, uh, our resident shortwave listener up there in Brisbane. Good to see you, Daz. I know you popped in at the last minute last week. Uh, good day to Kim, VK5 uh, FUSE over there in Adelaide. Uh, Richard, VK3 VRS, the uh, local uh, producer. And <laughs> uh, good day, Mike, VK3 XL. And uh, Martin, VK7 JAH. Uh, all very pleasant. Uh, Good evening to you guys on the chat window, and you can find the chat window at the Discord. Um, it is a Discord chat window, and uh, you can locate that via the ASV website at www.asv.org.au and uh, look under the Radio Astronomy tab and uh, look for the link to the ASV radio broadcast. Like I say, I trust everybody's okay. It's been uh, another week and um, a variety of things have occurred one way or another. Uh, but uh, let's hope that the uh, session tonight will bring some interesting news that you may not have heard of from an astronomical bent. All right. Um, and uh, I'm still waiting for my uh, HD boards to arrive from... Uh, Germany for the television transmitter here so I'm still broadcasting standard definition for the time being um, but uh, we're just waiting for our HD boards the uh, HD encoder and exciting unit to arrive which looks like it'll be now next week sometime <laughs> anyway um, we're looking forward to getting back to transmitting some HD on uh, on the ATV repeater all right, the Astronomical Society of Victoria, as we all know, was founded in 1922. It has well over 1,600 members scattered about the state and Australia and overseas. Membership of the Society, of course, is open to all persons with an interest in astronomy. Some of the Society's objectives are to encourage the study and practice of astronomy and to disseminate the knowledge of the science and to provide greater facilities for the study among its members. Monthly meetings are usually held on the second Wednesday of each month, except in January, the latter being held on a Saturday night. Meetings start at 8pm at the Molia Hall, National Herbarium, Burwood Avenue, Melbourne, near the Melbourne Observatory, which is located adjacent to the Shrine of Remembrance. Parking is available Burwood Avenue, Dallas Brooks Drive and the surrounding streets. Admission is free and visitors are most welcome indeed. Privileges of a membership include the right to borrow books, periodicals, magazines and other publications from the Society's extensive library located at Melbourne Observatory, receipt of the ASV magazine Crux containing articles, news, observing notes and the like. And that's actually just come through this week, the, the latest Crux, so I just sh shall hold it up. Something stuck on the front cover there. What is that? Oh, it's torn. Oh, it's torn. Okay. Anyway, this is the uh, the latest crux for those watching the TV. Um, so, uh, Victoria, the place to be for nightscapes. So, uh, there it is. And um, all glossy color and beautiful images and stories and things that will just take you 
into another world for a, an hour of reading, I would say. Maybe an hour and a half <laughs> worth of reading in there. And it smells lovely. Oh, I love the smell of new print. Anyway, that's another story. Um, so, getting back to the usual blurb. So, apart from the, the uh, magazine Crux, you also get a regular astronomical um, publication called the Astronomical Yearbook, which is this guy here. A decent, uh, a decent publication for astronomers. Um, kind of an almanac, I suppose you could call it. And, uh, yeah, so that's published on a yearly basis by the Society quite a nice publication it's been going for quite a while access is available to telescopes um, sorry access is available to telescopes sorry that is to say access is available yeah I said that right to telescopes on members nights held regularly at Melbourne Observatory <clears throat> and after the monthly meetings with the permitting these instruments include the society's 300 millimeter portable uh, equatorial reflector and a 300 millimeter portable reflector. There's also a 200 millimeter refractor uh, managed by the Royal Botanic Gardens, and a photoheliograph are also housed at the observatory and are accessible to members too. The society also has a, a number of 200 millimeter refractors available for short period loan to members trying to do try to um, wishing to try before the buy concept. Regular society club night meetings are held on the first and last Fridays of each month at the Lodge of the Society's property in Burwood. Members are encouraged to use the Society's instruments located there to gain first-hand experience in telescope use. These instruments include a 508mm equatorial reflector and a number of smaller telescopes. Members are also encouraged to make and use Society's country property located near Heathcote, some 90-minute drive north of Melbourne. Uh, there uh, are a range of instruments available for members to use, the larger two only requiring appropriate training to use, with the range which range from 300mm to 1000mm in aperture. Also located on the side is the 8.5m fully steerable radio telescope, uh, which members can access with involvement in the radio astronomy section. Members are encouraged to make and use telescopes. Advice and help on both matters are provided willingly to newcomers desiring to do the same. Of course, instrument making is only one of one of the number of common interest activities catered for within the society. There are, in fact, uh, 20 sections that make up the ASV. And they are, and I haven't read this out for a while, so here it is, um, starting in alphabetical order. The astronomical, uh, sorry, the astrophotography section, the Bendigo section, club section, comet section, commu computing section, cosmology and astrophysics section, deep sky section, demonstrators section. These guys go out on a weekly basis to demonstrate for the, their rights in viewing the sky. <laughs> Just joking. Uh, the diurnals, which meet on a Tuesday. Great Melbourne Telescope section, the historical section, instrument making, <laughs> and the historical section it always cracks me up. Um, I'm in a mood tonight, I can see that. Instrument making, juniors, lunar and planetary, meteor section, new astronomers group, outdoor lightning improvement, radio astronomy, solar and space exploration, which is a uh, new section. It's only been around for a few months. But apart from all that... Um, all those sections are generally run by a section director one way or another and uh, contact details for those section directors can be found from the ASV website under the sections tab where all those little sections that I just read out, read out they have a link and there's an individual page that opens up and uh, which usually provides uh, a, uh, an email to those section directors. So if you're interested in popping along to a, uh, a meeting. Some of these meetings are still being conducted on Zoom uh, and, uh, uh, and others are generally now conducted on Zoom uh, as opposed to actually meeting at the, uh, the uh, hall, um, the meeting club room at uh, Burwood. So uh, things are still changed, but you'll find out all those details um, about uh, popping in for a, a visit and, and seeing if the general discussion is of some value to you. Joining the ASV is a fairly easy process. It's just a matter of going to the website at www.asv.org.au and uh, 
uh, within the first paragraph or so of uh, the first page is the link to membership and all is perfectly uh, done from there all via PayPal and uh, you're in like Flint and um, was it in like Flynn anyway uh, and uh, uh, within a week or so you'll be uh, uh, mailed a members pack as such so uh, all very good now with COVID uh, um, not being too much of an issue for us in travelling uh, the Dark Sky site is now of course um, open to members at uh, any time although there is still a, um, a booking process involved it's just to make sure that uh, those who look after the uh, the site up there are uh, aware of uh, who is uh, on the property for safety reasons and um, and uh, those general reasons. <laughs> anyway, uh, so there it is. Um, of course, if you if you like to uh, write a, a letter by hand, you can send a mail send mail to the secretary of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, GPO Box ten fifty nine. Uh, to Melbourne, Victoria, 3001, and uh, all very good. And of course, the last paragraph here is to please note that the ASV will conform to all government health directives. ASV events may be required to be cancelled, moved or postponed at a drop, uh, drop of the hat. Um, so there it is. You're tuned to AFCV Radio. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3, EKH. I'm trying to find some space on the bench here. <sighs> Good evening to everybody. Trust everybody as well. 12 minutes past the hour. Uh, we have three emails. I forgot to mention that. If you wish to send a report tonight, I'd be interested to, to know if the audio is okay because I really didn't have any, any time to, to put my headphones on tonight to see if everything is in fact okay. Uh, so if the audio sounds nice and hi-fi on 160 and close to it on 80, then I'll be pleased. Um, I have noticed in, in playing back uh, my uh, the, the last week's broadcast, you can you can view these broadcasts that I do on YouTube. Uh, YouTube has this tendency to record stuff. Uh, so um, uh, previous uh, broadcasts are uh, sitting on some YouTube server somewhere. I uh, I. I think the idea for me anyway is to just keep them there for a few weeks and then delete them. There's no point in having things like that hanging around. Uh, so uh, this, this, like I say, this session tonight will be sitting on YouTube. I notice that there's about 20 folks that seem to um, to link into the to the YouTube feed, so that's not too bad as opposed to the odd million that uh, people get around the place. I'm not after the numbers. Um, anyway. Oh, it looks like Roberto's there too, Mr. VK3XRA. G'day, Mr. Rob. And uh, who else is there? No, that's it at the stage. G'day, Rob. Uh, and we have Don uh, with VK3HDX with the report on the email. Did I mention the email? VK3EKH at gmail.com. VK3EKH at gmail.com. I'm viewing the inbox as we speak. And... Uh, because I'm looking up here, there's a screen just up here. In fact, I've got a, another camera that I can switch in here. I've got three cameras on me tonight, uh, all, all nicely uh, switchable, and uh, hopefully the audio won't disappear, though. Um, oh, no, look, it's still hanging in there. That's, it's a perfect shot of the back of my head there. Uh, <laughs> but you can see up here, on, on for those watching YouTube and the, the ATV, there's the inbox for my mail, my email. <laughs> and the Discord uh, chat window, so I can see folks uh, chatting amongst themselves on the Discord. My big screen here that I, that I use for vMix and uh, for uh, reading off. So I once caught a fish this big, and uh, you can see on this side here is the TV system and HF1 and HF2. So there it is, this quick view of the uh, operating conditions here and the clocks on the wall there, one in uh, local and one in UTC. They're off. I haven't got the lights on. Yeah, okay. It's all right. These two lights here I would normally have on, but it looks like there's plenty of illumination there at the moment, so I'm not too worried about that. And that's uh, that's my USB camera. Uh, just uh, switched in there, so that's uh, coming in just off the radios. <laughs> there's a little bit of a show around the, the radio shack here. All right. What was I leading up to before I was horribly distracted um, 
You're tuned to AS3 Radio, VK3 EKH. We have a few articles tonight, and uh, let's get started with the first one. Oh, yeah, Sky Notes. Um, okay, there's a few dates I can uh, start off here with. Um, okay, uh, oh, hang on a sec. Uh, I've just checked these emails out. I didn't read the emails straight up. I was going to do that while I was on the camera. Um, yeah, okay, so that's from Donnie. So signals to the 59 plus 30, uh, 30 over 9 on 160. Sounds great, and YouTube looking good. Thanks, Don. That's all I needed to know. Uh, there's one from Andrew, VK3KIS, and he says, chilling here in Ringwood. Uh, was it, what, just my broadcast is chilling, or? <laughs> uh, 59 plus this evening, he says, I will join the call back using the QRP power levels. Okay, I shall make sure I reduce the noise level for you. Um, and there's also one from, uh, hang on, um, uh, somebody by the name of Graham. He says, hi, Clint, good reports on 80 and 160 this evening, working this evening and should be back uh, on the callbacks. That's Mr. Lewis. Okay, thanks, Graham. Not a problem. Uh, and there's one from Stuart as well, the K3 year. Uh, uh, um, um, you, oh, I've forgotten your call sign. You didn't leave, leave it there either. <laughs> um, you you owe something. Um, anyway, you says good copy in northern suburbs of Melbourne, 80 metres. Yeah, Stuart, you're right. UAO, I knew it was a UAO. Yep, yeah, g'day, Stuart. Um, all right. I'll leave it back to there now. All right, back to the uh, current date situation. <clears throat> it is the 17th today, so I'll kick it off at 18. Yeah, okay. On the 18th of June, 1983, Sally Rye becomes the first American woman in space aboard the Shuttle Challenger. The Shuttle Challenger. On the 20th of June, 1990, asteroid Eureka, found as part of the Trojans asteroid group orbit, uh, orbiting at Mars L5 Lagrange point. I think I mentioned that last week. On the 21st of June, uh, 2004, uh, Spaceship One is launched as the first privately funded human space flight. I also mentioned that. Also on the 21st of June 2006, Pluto's small moon Nix and Hydra are named. On the 22nd of June 1633, Galileo recants his sun-centered solar system model under the threat of torture by the Catholic Inquisition. Those were the days. On the also on the twenty second of June, nineteen seventy eight, Doctor James Christie, USA, discovers Pluto's large moon Charon. On the twenty fourth of June, eighteen eighty three, discoverer of cosmic rays, Victor Francis Hess, is born. Also on the twenty fourth of June, nineteen fifteen, birth of Fred Hoyle, who later explains the creation of elements in stars, promotes the steady state model of the universe, and coins the pejorative term Big Bang for the rival model of the universe's creation beginning. Uh, also on the 24th of June, it's a bit here to read actually, um, on the 20, also on the 24th of June 1997, uh, the first life-threatening space collision occurs as Russia's Progress supply craft collides with Mir space station during a test docking while not using its automated docking and radar system. The aging problem plagued station suffers a three centimeter puncture in the Svika module, which quickly depressurizes. U.S. astronaut Mike Foley evacuates from the damaged module in time, and Mia spins out of control as solar power is lost. Progress rebounds, uh, but it but is later safely deorbited to burn up. Control is slowly regained by the cosmonaut Vasily Zevbelov, assisted by cosmonaut Askelsander Lazikin and Foley. This serious incident heightens tensions between America's space agency NASA and the Russian counterpart Roscosmos. Rosca, Rosco, Cosmos, Roscosmos, that's it. Uh, also, not also, but on the 29th of uh, um, June 1818, uh, Angelo born was born, one of the first astronomers to, to believe that the sun is a star. Okay. 
Also on the 29th of June 1961, first use in space of a radioisotope thermoelectric generator or RTG. Uh, using plutonium, yes, I have one of those in my computer, which powered uh, uh, <laughs> which powered a U.S. Navy Navsat satellite Transat 4A. Uh, also on the 29th of June 1995, Space Shuttle Atlantis is first well, first docking uh, at Russia's Mir space station. On the 30th of June 1908, the Tunguska event. I think we all all uh, read about that one, the Tunguska event. A meteor, several meteors, that is to say, a meteor, several meters <laughs> in size, explodes over Tunguska, Russia, destroying 2,200 square kilometers of forest in a multi-megaton blast. And uh, also, finally, on the 30th of June, uh, 1917, sorry, 1971, that's my dyslexia kicking in there, 1971, Soyuz 11 USSR is the only mission to visit the first space station, Soil at 1 USSR, after which its crew of three become the only humans known to have died in space when their cabin depressurizes prior to or, or during re-entry. Cool. Okay, well, that finishes the uh, events for June. <clears throat> You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3, Echo Kilo Hotel. <sighs> okay, I was going to read this one out last week, and I left it for this week. And there is a picture for this, so I shall bring up that image on the screen. One, two, three. Yep, still there. Okay, this is a um, an artist's impression. Uh, a dwarf in dwarf galaxies, the light of young stars competes with the emission from a growing black hole. Um, original image by NASA and Space Hubble, but artist's conception of a black hole with a jet. The article here. Scientists uncover new population of massive black holes. A clever way to find a previously under overlooked population of dwarf galaxies could answer questions about how supermassive black holes grow so big. Supermassive black holes, millions or billions of times the mass of the Sun, lie at the centers of large galaxies like the Milky Way. But astronomers don't know how they got there. They do know, however, that galaxies grow by merging. One theory for how such massive black holes form is that the early universe was rife with dwarf galaxies and or with and sorry, with smaller <laughs> so-called intermediate mass black holes or IMBHs, hundreds to thousands of solar masses at their centers. Over time, these dwarfs merged or were swallowed by larger galaxies, their cores combining each time to build up a monster in the middle of, of the final galaxy. But until recently, only a tiny fraction of dwarf galaxies were actually known to host massive black holes in their centers. This is because cl black classic black hole haunting techniques, which look for the bright accretion disks around actively feeding black holes, called active galactic nuclei, or AGN, were developed with larger galaxies and their black holes in mind, and aren't suitable for finding black, hole, black holes in dwarf galaxies. But now, a recent study published in the Astrophysical Journal and led by scientists at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill has discovered a previously hidden population of black holes with the, with the help of an improved classification scheme. A new perspective. <clears throat> Whilst looking for black holes using traditional techniques back in 2014, Sheila Kenappen, along with undergraduate students Ashley Bittner and Carolyn Ferguson, identified a particular type of dwarf galaxy for which three traditional diagnostic tests for finding black holes have different answers. 
Two of the tests say there is an AGN, while the third says only uh, only star formation is present. Dwarf galaxies are more primordial in their composition and have tons of star forming going on, Kapanen says. And the mission or or uh, or glow fr- the mission or glow from star formation can compete with with the emission from the AGN, making it hard to tell whether an AGN is really there. This is why the tests designed for giant galaxies don't work as well on them, she explains. The particular test that fails to recognize an AGN is is present is sensitive to the abundance of the higher elements we call metals, which dwarfs don't have as much of. So... Canapican's group developed a test that took these characteristics into account. Instead of growing away galaxies with conflicting test results, that is to say, instead of throwing away galaxies with conflicting test results, they identified them as a new category. Then, team member Chris Richardson of Leon University followed up with the computer simulations, simulations, which showed an agreement between galaxies in the new category and theoretical predictions for the output of a model dwarf galaxy with an IMBH. Graduate student Magda Polemera led another uh, lead author, I should say, of the study, applied the new selection technique to published spectroscopic measurements of galaxies in two surveys, Resolve and Echo. What she found surprised everyone. More than 80% of the black of active black holes detected in dwarf galaxies turned out to be part of this pre- previously hidden population, meaning that they would otherwise have been missed. We went through a list of all the possible explanations, Polymer says, to make sure that they were really picking up signals from growing black holes. Could it be extreme star formation, she asks? Could it be some other exotic astrophysics, some kind of diffuse gas? In the end, we concluded that we were seeing was most likely from black holes. This study represents nearly a decade of work for Kenepin and her group in their technique. If their technique proves reliable, it could provide the first con- concrete evidence that supermassive black holes are built from mergings or mergers of dwarf galaxies with IMBHs. Rommel Dave of the University of Edinburgh, who has or who was not part of the study, is also cautiously optimistic about this new method and the treasure trove of black holes it has uncovered. Theorists like myself are very good at coming up with clever ideas, Dave says, uh, but to know if something is right, well, that requires actual data. This study provides uh, the first real constraints for how many black holes in dwarf galaxies might really be out there. And that article you can find on astronomy.com. It's uh, June 9, called Scientists Uncover New Population of Massive Black Holes. Bless them. Okay. That wasn't a. Uh, that was a particularly tough one to start the session off with tonight. I felt. All right, here's a shorter one. <laughs> uh, courtesy of space.com. Seven days ago, this one. This was also held over from last Friday, and there's an image for this too. I can throw up on the screen. Uh, there it is. Okay, uh, what we have here is Earth's magnetic poles probably won't flip soon. After all, a mysterious anomaly had sparked speculation of polarity reversal. And what you're seeing there, of course, is an artist's depiction of Earth's magnetic field. <laughs> Earth's magnetic field may not be heading toward a dramatic flip anytime soon, according to scientists who analysed anomalies in the planet's invisible shield against solar wind and other radiation. Earth's magnetic north and south poles switch at regular intervals at an average of every 200,000 years or so, and the event could have a dramatic effect on the environment and technology. 
there had been speculation that the next flip was close because of the South Atlantic anomaly, a mysterious area in which the magnetic field is usually weak. However, this anomaly may not indicate that a weakening and switching of the magnetic field are intimate according to a new study. We have mapped changes in the Earth's magnetic field over the past 9,000 years and anomalies like the one in, South, in the South Atlantic are probably reoccurring phenomena linked to corresponding variations in the strength of the Earth's magnetic field. Andressa Nilsson, a geologist at Lund University and co-author of the study, said in a statement, The results are based on analysis of burnt, um, uh, burnt archaeological artifacts, volcanic samples and sediment drill cores, which contain for information on the history of Earth's magnetic field. The team from Lund University used this data to develop a model that recreated the direction and strength of the magnetic field at specific places and times. Based on the similarities with the recreated anomalies, we predict that, that the South Atlantic anomaly will probably disappear within the next 300 years and that Earth is not heading towards a polarity reversal, Nielsen said. The study was published June 6 in the journal PNAS. Okay, that's nice and short. That's how I love them. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3. EKH. <laughs> Trying to get this cup of coffee into me, stimulate the brain cells. Okay, next on the article here is something from NASA. Uh, oh, yes. Okay, did I put in images here? I think I've got one image here to uh, put up. And uh, let me see, uh, where are we? There it is. <sighs> okay, it's a picture of a rocket launching. <laughs> oh dear. Okay, NASA SpaceX launch, DART, first planetary defense test mission. This is not exactly a new news, um, but we are coming up to when this event will occur, if it hasn't already. Um, but this is not a very long article either, at least I hope it won't be. Um, okay, <clears throat> what the picture you're seeing on the screen uh, is a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket lifts off from Space Launch Complex 4 at the Vandenberg Space Force Base in California on November 23rd, 2021, carrying NASA's double asteroid redirection mission spacecraft. NASA's double asteroid redirection test, or DART, D-A-R-T, the world's first full-scale mission to test technology for defending Earth against potential asteroid or comet hazards, launched Wednesday um, on a uh, Falcon X-9 rocket, uh, SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket, from Space Launch Complex 4 in California. Just one part of NASA's large planetary defense strategy, DART, built and managed by the John Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory in Laurel, Maryland, will impact a known asteroid that is not a threat to Earth. Its goal is to slightly change the asteroid's motion in a way that can be accurate, accurately measured using ground-based telescopes. DART will show that a spacecraft can autonomously navigate to a target asteroid and intentionally collide with it a method of deflection called kinetic impact. The test will provide important data to help better prepare for an asteroid that might pose an impact hazard to Earth, should one ever be discovered. The uh, LICA cube, L-I-C-I-A cube, LICA cube, uh, a cube sat, uh, riding with DART provided by the Italian Space Agency will be released prior to DART's impact to capture images of the impact and resulting cloud of ejected matter. Roughly four years after DART's impact, the European Space Agency HERA project will con conduct detailed surveys of both asteroids with particular focus on the craft left by DART's collision and a precise determination of the dimorphous mass, dimorphous mass. DART is turning science fiction into science fact and is a testament of NASA's proactivity and innovation for all the benefit of all, said NASA Administrator Bill Nielsen. 
In addition to all the ways NASA studies our universe and our home planet, we are also working to protect that home um, and that, that the test will help provide out one viable way to protect our planet from hazardous asteroid should one ever be discovered that is headed toward Earth. At 2.17 a.m., DART separated from the second stage of the rocket. Minutes later, mission operators received the first spacecraft telemetry data and started the process of orientating the spacecraft to a safe position for deploying its solar arrays. About two hours later, the spacecraft completed the successful unfurling of its two 28-foot-long rollout solar arrays. They will power both the spacecraft and NASA's evolutionary Exxon thruster commercial ion engine, one of several technologies being tested on DART for future application on space missions. At its core, DART is a mission of preparedness and it is also a mission of unity, uh, said Thomas Zerbuchen, Associate Minister of, for the Science Mission Directorate at NASA's headquarters in Washington. This internal um, international collaboration involves DART, ASI and Lycra Cube and ISA's HERA, H-E-R-A, HERA, investigations and science teams which will follow up on the groundbreaking science uh, mission. DART's one-way trip is to the Didymos asteroid system, uh, which comprises a pair of asteroids. DART's target is the moonlet Dimorph Dimorphus, Dimorphus, which is approximately 160 metres in diameter. The moonlet orbits Didymos, which is approximately 780 metres in diameter. Since Dimorphos orbits Didymos, at much uh, at slower relative speed than the pair orbits the Sun, the result of DART's kinetic impact within the binary system can be measured much more easily than a change in the orbit of a single asteroid around the Sun. We have not yet found any significant asteroid impact threat to Earth, but we continue to search for that sizable population we know is still to be found. Our goal is to find any possible impact years to decades in advance, so it can be deflected with a capability like DART that is possible within the technology we currently have. DART is one aspect of NASA's work to prepare Earth should we ever be faced with an asteroid hazard. In tandem with the test, we are preparing the Near Earth Orbit Surveyor Mission, a space-based infrared telescope scheduled for launch later this decade and designed to expedite our ability to discover and characterize the potentially hazardous asteroid and comets that come within 30 million miles of Earth's orbit. I'll just uh, take go back to the camera here. All right, there's just another couple of paragraphs. Um, okay, uh, DART's single <clears throat> DART's single instrument, the Didymos Reconnaissance and Asteroid Camera for Optical Navigation, DRACO, they love their acronyms, will turn on a week from now and provide the first images of the spacecraft. DART will continue to travel just outside the Earth's orbit around the Sun for the next 10 months until Didymos and Dimorphos, uh, Dimorphos will be at a relatively close 11 million kilometers from Earth. A, system, a sophisticated guidance, navigation and control system working together with algorithms called Small Body Maneuvering Autotominous Real-Time Navigation or Smart Nav will enable the DART spacecraft to identify and distinguish between two asteroids. The system will then direct the spacecraft toward Dimorphos. This process will all occur within roughly an hour of impact. John Hopkins, APL, man manages the DART mission for NASA's Planetary Defense Coordination Office as a project of the agency's Planetary Missions Program Office. NASA provides support for the missions for several centers, including the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Oh, I'll leave it at that. It's just a bunch of advertising. So there it is, DART. Now, <laughs> I have a feeling it's already hit, impacted uh, Didymos, uh, Dimorphos, sorry. Um, and uh, I don't know exactly how come I, I came across this article for uh, last week. 
It might have been something on um, Facebook. But I'll follow that up next week with a, um, a results uh, a results one, if I can find anything. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3EKH. Time is 19 minutes to the hour. Now, this is pretty current. Uh, Wednesday, 15th of June, 2022. A fast-growing black hole of past 9 billion years discovered in bright constellation of Centaurus. And there's actually a picture here. Uh, I'm not sure if this is optical or radio. It doesn't say. Well, I haven't read it yet, so it might be a um, radio. But uh, here it is anyway. Um, where, did it, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? <sighs> I, didn't, uh, I didn't bring it across. Oh, okay. All right. Doesn't matter. Um, okay. But what I do have is that picture. I'll come back to it in a minute. Um, okay. The article says... Black holes are the gluttons of the cosmos, devouring everything that veers too close, including light itself. Now, an international team of researchers say that they have discovered a supermassive black hole that gobbles up the equivalent of one Earth every second. By looking at other luminous objects that are billions of years old, the team confirmed the newly discovered Bimoth, Bimoth, uh, was the brightest and the fastest growing supermassive black hole of the past 9 billion years that we know of. <laughs> Located in the bright constellation of Centaurus, this luminous cosmic beast is more than 500 times larger than the supermassive black hole at the center of our own galaxy. Uh, and I've got a, a star map here for those that might be interested where it is located. Here is the star map. There it is. So where you see the red circle, J1144, is the approximate location for this object. Continuing on with the article. <clears throat> God, each time I do that, I lose my spot. Um, I'll go there. A needle in the haystack. The team stumbled across this unusual object while they, they were hunting for close pairs of binary stars. The stars that orbit around the same center of mass in the Milky Way. They were using the Sky Mapper Telescope at Siding Spring Observatory near Coonabarabin between the central west and northwest slopes of regions of New South Wales. Adrian Lucy, a PhD student at Columbia University, New York, found around 200 binary star candidates, but there was something strange among them, according to Dr. Onken. One of them turned out to be something not at all like a binary system. To take a closer look at the oddball object, the team went to the South American, sorry, South African Astronomical Observatory 1.9 meter telescope in Cape Town. Here, they were able to look at the various wavelengths of light coming from the object, which they call MSS, S, sorry, SMSS J114447.77-4308596. I think you can all remember that, or <laughs> J1144 for short I just love that uh, and it didn't look anything like a giant star instead the object had bright lines that suggested gas was moving very fast indicating it was a powerful uh, was powered by a supermassive black hole and I've got an artist's impression of that which I'll bring up there it is <laughs> and there's something else in there too which I'll bring up Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, next. Um, so, supermassive super black holes, which have a mass of millions or billions of suns, are the engines that drive some of the brightest objects in the sky, quasars. From Earth, these luminous objects look a bit like stars, but their light actually comes from the ring of gas, dust and stars swirling around the black hole, known as an accretion disk. As this material gets sucked into the gaping mouth of the black hole by its intense gravitational pull, it gets super hot and emits bright light, as depicted in the image on the screen. Uh, the gas is kind of funneling down into a pancake shape and that the material then heats up through friction. Like a ball rolling out a hit down a hill, the material moves faster as it goes closer, it gets closer to the black hole event horizon, the point at which not even light 
can escape, giving up its potential energy. Eventually, all that stuff falls into the black hole past and uh, the, the event horizon, adding to the sup- adding to the mass of the black hole as it does so. And there's a uh, another image here, which is um, actually generated by a com- computer simulation of what a black hole would look like. This, uh, some of you might be aware that um, the movie Interstellar. Um, they uh, approached uh, astrophysicists to uh, come up, put into a supercomputer a possible image for what uh, the black hole would look like, as depicted in Interstellar. Uh, the what you're seeing on the screen right now is uh, a part of that computer simulation, which, uh, like I say, was shown in the movie uh, Interstellar. Great music score. Um, to finish off this article. Yep, it's only a few paragraphs. Um, it was this luminous, fast-moving swirl of gas that allowed Dr. Onken and his team to measure the supermassive black hole's mass at an estimated 3 billion suns. Goodness gracious me. To put that in perspective, the supermassive black hole at the centre of our galaxy, Sagittarius A, has a mass of about 4 million suns. And while J1144 was fainter than other quasars identified over the last 60 years, it was much further away and still much brighter than other objects of a similar age. And that was very exciting because these are pretty unusual finds, Dr. Onken said. The team also compared J1144's luminosity over the past 45 years by looking at how it appeared in previous data sets. They found that the Bimoth quasar had remained constantly bright over time, indicating that its black hole was constantly chewing on gas anything else that, and anything else that came its way. Michael Cowley, an astrophysicist at the Queensland University of Technology, said that the size of the supermassive black hole probably meant it was associated with a hefty galaxy. Uh, usually, you'll find that one. Uh, you, you, you'll usually find that the more massive the the black hole, uh, the more massive the galaxy as well," said Dr. Howley, uh, Cowley, who was uh, not involved in the study. This quasar's light shines around seven thousand times brighter than all the light in the Milky Way, which means you can you can glimpse it from your backyard with the right telescope. I'll leave that there. I think. Uh, so you can find that article um, on, uh, I think it's a, um, let me go back to it. Uh, no, it's an ABC News article. Yep, ABC News, science, under the science category. Fast growing black hole of past 9 billion years discovered in bright constellation of Centaurus. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel. The official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria. G'day to John, VK3BLX, and Cassiopeia, who've also joined in the discussion. <coughs> okay, we haven't got much time left, so let's pick the more juiciest articles that I've got here. Um, yeah, we're kind of harp- harking on. Uh, a common theme tonight. Uh, I, I see. I see. So, um, um, yeah, might leave that till next week. Yeah, this is sort of short. No pictures for this, so it's me on camera. <laughs> Let me change the uh, the view. All right. Article is: How do astronauts sleep in space? They close their eyes. Between zero gravity and small sleeping quarters, astronauts have to sleep in space even if it's difficult. June 16, 2022. In 1963, Gordon Cooper piloted the longest and last Mercury space flight, Mercury Atlas 9. While Cooper was up in space on a 34-hour mission, he became the first American to spend an entire day in space and the first to sleep in space. But how does an astronaut sleep in space? How do it... Um, sorry, they do it carefully. <laughs> there was a question mark and that's how... Continue, I stuffed it up. Uh, 
Anyway, they do it carefully and it's vital that they do. A lack of sleep can cause fatigue that can lead to errors while performing critical tasks. If a groggy astronaut does something wrong, it could be a matter of life and death or death. Floating while asleep or floating while sleeping. Cooper was launched on May 15, 1963. He orbited Earth 22 times and slept as, the, as he spun around the globe. He returned to Earth, merging from the capsule. His sleeping quarters were cramped. On the International Space Station, an astronaut sleeps in quarters roughly the size of a phone booth. They cocoon themselves in a sleeping bag tethered to a wall. There is no up or down in space. With zero gravity, an astronaut floats around the cabin while sleeping, potentially injuring themselves if not tethered in space. In place, <laughs> it felt odd. Notes Scott Kelly in a recent interview. Kelly is a retired astronaut who spends 520 days in space. Who spent 520 days in space? It was strange for Kelly to sleep without the weight of a blanket or the comfort of a pillow to rest his head. Eventually, I was sleeping with my head kind of velcroed to a cushion, so it feels like your head is up against a pillow, says Kelly. An astronaut's sleeping quarters needs good ventilation. In the weightlessness environment of space, astronauts expel carbon dioxide that could form a bubble around their heads. Oh, that's interesting. They sleep near an air vent to avoid this potential lack of oxygen to the brain. Brain cells are sensitive. In less than five minutes, brain cells can start to die without oxygen. Brain hypoxia can cause brain damage or worse death. Space is silent, but a spacecraft is not. Space is dark, but the sun is not. Astronauts wear earplugs to combat the noise and face masks to combat bright light. The ISS goes 17,100 miles per hour. That means an astronaut aboard it can see 15 to 16 sunrises a day. As Scott Kelly notes, even though you have, <clears throat> even though you have window shades on the windows, the sun in space is really bright and it seeps through, through them. Astronauts have reportedly had dreams of, and nightmares in space. Some astronauts snore in space as well. Crews on the IWS average around six hours of sleep per day. NASA schedules their astronauts with eight to eight and a half hours of sleep. Wish I could get that. Astronauts frequently suffer from the effects of sleep deprivation and the circadian rhythm disruption. A lack of sleep can lead to mood swings, wakened immunity, high blood pressure, poor balance, and other tedious effects. Del del no, it's not that. Deleterious effects. Uh, though Cooper was the first American to sleep in space, Cosmonaut Guman Tiodov uh, was the first human to ever sleep in space. The second human to orbit the Earth, uh, Titov's flight on August 6, 1961, proved that humans could live, work, and sleep in space. He did it aboard Voskhod 2, orbiting Earth 17 times. Cooper would orbit the Earth again in 1965, aboard Gemini 5, uh, with uh, Pete Conrad. Their mission was nearly eight days long, enough for a crew to fly to the moon and back. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were both members of the Gemini 5, backup crew. Sleep would prove challenging for Cooper and Conrod. Cooper called the mission eight days in a garbage can. <laughs> the can the can was the spacecraft, the space capsule of course. The cabin was the size of the front seat of the Volkswagen Beetle. On October 4, 2004, Gordon Cooper passed away at the age of 77 in Ventura, California. In an eternal sleep, his ashes were sent up into space to sleep with the stars. That's a nice way to go. All right, you're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 EKH. You can find that article 
on how do astronauts sleep in space on astronomy.com uh, June 16 okay less than five minutes on my clock here oh yes I was going to leave that till next week and I was going to leave that till next week because that's pretty long um, perseverance this is an interesting little interesting gif image here I'll bring up that because this this one works um, okay just bring it up go back to vmix uh, where's my there it is animated image um, okay and I better loop it because it'll stop otherwise all right um, snapshot perseverance sees Martian dust devils there it is it's working pretty well the wild weather of Jezero crater poses potential problem for the rover June 13 once it was rare to get a glimpse of the surface of another planet in our solar system. Now, thanks to NASA's Preference Perseverance rover, we not only get near daily images from Mars, but we get even get to see its weather. Perseverance caught the first ever video of gusts lifting a massive Martian dust cloud last year, and now the rover has captured the swirling whirlwinds of dust devils on the red planet. According to a NASA press release, at least four whirl whirlwinds pass Perseverance on a typical Martian day. A paper detailing all the weather phenomena that Perseverance has detected was published May 25 in Science Advances. Every time we land in a new place on Mars, it's an opportunity to better understand the planet's weather, said paper's lead author Claire Newman. Um, and Jezero Crater seems to be virtually uh, a um, cornucopia of Martian weather. That's a new word for me. Cornucopia. Cornu. Cornucopia of Martian weather. Have to look that up. Even though dust and wind can be found all over Mars, Jezero Crater in particular seems to have an influx of both. The researchers think that this might be a result of being uh, near so-called dust storm track uh, running along the planet's surface while storm winds frequently loft dust into the air. This is exciting for scientists because there is no telling what other kind of weather perseverance might see. We need a regional dust storm right on top of us in January. Sorry, we had a regional dust storm right on top of us in January, but we 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 are still in the middle of a dust season, so uh, we're very likely to see more dust storms. But there is a drawback to increased weather, unlike Insight, that's the probe Insight, which is facing a permanent retirement due to dust accumulation. Perseverance relies on nuclear power instead of solar. This means that the rover's power levels aren't affected even if it gets coated in dust, but its instrumentation is still vulnerable to airborne debris. Already, this increased dust has damaged the, world, the, the wiring of, uh, of um, the wiring for rover's two Mars Environmental Dynamics Analyzer, or META, sensors. META is what enables Perseverance to make weather instruments such as a wind speed and direction, temperature and humidity. We collect a lot of great science data, said Manuel D. Tartores Jerez, META's Deputy Principal Investigator at JPL. The wind sensors are seriously impacted, ironically, because we got what we wanted to measure. This isn't the first time that one of NASA's rovers was beasted by dust whirlwinds, or maybe that's bested. <laughs> oh dear. Uh, was bested by dust filled winds. Curiosity own wind sensors were also damaged by a whirlwind. Uh, NASA added a di an additional coating of meta wiring. Uh, but the reinforcement was no match for Jezero Crater's weather. Now NASA is trying to find software solutions that could allow the sensors to keep on working. So there it is. It's a nice little uh, image there of the surface of Mars with a few little dust devils on it. Yeah, it's all very good stuff indeed. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, where the time has just gone... 11 o'clock. That coffee's lasted me over an hour.
and it's just gone lukewarm. Um, <laughs> All righty then. Um, okay, where am I now? Oh, yes, spaceweather.com. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Mount Burnett. I was going to give a plug for Mount Burnett. If you're a local astronomer or local to the mountains, um, you can visit Mount Burnett Observatory. Um, Mount Burnett Observatory is a not-for-profit astronomical society based at Mount Burnett in the Dandenong Ranges, east of Melbourne. The observatory was originally built by Monash University in 1972. Staff and students used the telescopes at Mount Burnett for many years, but as astronomy entered the digital era, the analogue equipment at the observatory was superseded by larger, more modern telescopes elsewhere. When MBO was formed in 2011, the observatory had not been used for several years. Mount Burnett Observatory is now the focus of a thriving community of astronomers of all ages drawn together by a common love of learning about the night sky and objects in it. MBO acknowledges that the observatory is built on the lands of the Wundjeri people and the Bungorong people in South East Kulon Nation, for what it's worth. Um, so, Mount Burnett Observatory can be found on the web. There's also a Facebook page. For more information, I suggest you Google it. Uh, and that, well, let's just go straight to spaceweather.com. <laughs> it's going over time as I speak. Um, all right, bring up the sun. There it is on the vision screen, view monitor. Uh, the solar wind is currently at 614.3 kilometers a second it is a gale density 10.21 protons per cubic centimeter uh, there are currently as you can see on the screen one two three four five six seven eight nine there are nine sunspots nine sunspots on the current disk of the sun the sun is active lots of sunspots Today, there are nine, I've just counted it, there it is. There are nine sunspot, sunspot groups on the solar disk, the most in years. If only one explodes, Earth could experience a solar storm. The most likely would be sunspot AR3031, uh, which has an unstable beta gamma magnetic field that harbors energy for M class solar flares. The radio sun is currently, oh, this is the highest I've seen it too. The radio sun is at 147 solar flux units measured at a wavelength of 10.7 centimeters. And as mentioned last week, if you go to VK3, if you search VK3 Fox Sierra, VK3 FS webpage, he has a dedicated webpage to solar uh, observations and the data that comes through. That's VK3 Fox Sierra. Um, Okay, going down the page quickly. <clears throat> now let's have a quick look at the uh, Antarctica uh, aurora. Oh, it's not very strong. No, the aurora borealis borealis is um, yeah. There's a small ring, but nothing much to uh, cry on about. Um, okay, as of June 17, 2022, there were 2,279 potentially hazard asteroids. But uh, we don't have to worry about them at the moment. I think that's about it for solar weather. Um, you can go to spaceweather.com for uh, more inf uh, regularly updated information on uh, what's happening out there. Uh, I think that's about it for tonight. Um, I don't know if there's anything up and coming events. I, uh, I think I mentioned about the supermoon last week. Uh, but I can't remember what I did. But that did occur around Wednesday, I think. And uh, it was noticeably large. Um, I think it's about 10% larger than normal. Something like that. 10%? No, that doesn't sound right. Anyway, but it was noticeably a little bit bigger. <laughs> uh, all right. This is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with the regular Friday night broadcast. Coming to you from the studios of VK3 Charlie Sierra Juliet in Narry Warren South, broadcasting on 160 metres and 80 metres. Our medium wave surface is about to conclude, so um, I thank anybody who was listening to the AM signal tonight. Um, 
I do appreciate any reports of the AM signal and uh, which can be sent to VK3 EKH at gmail.com VK3 EKH at gmail.com This is VK3 EKH More information about the Astronomical Society of Victoria uh, can be found at www.asv.org.au And uh, on that note, we shall conclude our service on 1865 AM. We'll be back next Friday to do it all again. So thank you for listening. Stand by stations on 80 metres for our 80 metre callback. This is VK3 EKH. Oh, hang on. I've still got the sun up on the screen. Let me just go back to camera. Right. Sorry about that. Talking with the sun. Um... This is VK3 EKH, concluding transmissions on 1865. Please stand by for 400 hertz tone. Not really. Cheers, everyone. Okay. <laughs> okay, this is VK3 EKH. Now, I'm just getting my notepad and pen. And... Uh, we had quite a few stations there on um, um, Discord tonight. It's good to see uh, the folks there. John, uh, VK3 BLX, says 160 sounds good, but competing with high noise level here. Yeah, it's always the way. Um, Just looking at other comments there from other blokes. Um, Mike says 160 and 80 are good audio here. YouTube is also good audio. Thank you, Michael, son. Uh... Yeah, I think that's about it. All right. No other emails. Let's go across to 80 metres. Hopefully, I did have some local noise here on 80 metres just before I started transmission. I hope it won't be there when I uh, drop off. This is VK3. Oops, wrong button. This is VK3 EKH listening on 3541 for any stations wishing to check in. Well, you know, I've got this noise that happens to be right on 3541. Um, and uh, <laughs> now my changeover relay is not uh, switching in. Uh, it's um, It was producing, well it is, with the relay was switched in. Uh, it's uh, producing 20 over 9 noise. Um, we might just have to kill us why, chaps, uh, because I'm not going to hear anybody over that noise. Let me just check uh, nearby frequencies. Hang on a sec. Four, five. Bloody hell. Four five. If we if we can kill us, why three five four five three five four five? I I hope there's nobody sitting on four five. I didn't particularly ask. We'll see if we can d- disturb somebody. But four five is pretty clear. So let's kill us, why up four kilohertz um, to three five four five three five four five. Thanks, guys. Okay, we've got VK3GL, VK3DX, VK3HDX. Who else is there? All right, VK3GL, VK3DX, VK3HDX, VK3TJS, VK3India Sierra. Uh, is there any other stations wishing to check in? All right, VK3, uh, now, J-A-N. Was it Juliet, Juliet Alpha November? I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. VK3, Juliet Alpha November, was that correct? Yeah, I'm not sure. All right. Uh, <laughs> and VK3, Brava India Sierra, was it? Hello, India Sierra. 
Uh, sorry about that. Yeah, it's it's because my uh, changeover relay hasn't switched in. So if it's not if it's not local interference, my changeover relay hasn't switched in. God damn it! All right, but you're most of you are, uh, are, I can hear quite well now because we're gone away from that interference. VK three GL Graham, have a say. VK three EKH. Yes, Yeah, okay, Graham, VK3GL, VK3EKH uh, returning, and uh, I've uh, re- turned the, the power amplifier off because it wasn't, uh, really wasn't switching in, so I'm running 100 watts barefoot at the moment. You might notice a, a slight uh, lesser signal. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, but for some reason that relay, so uh, it sticks. Thanks, Graham. A uh, good signal from you. You're 20 over 9 and uh, quite consistent and uh, coming through very clear and uh, yeah I, I agree the um, uh, some of the uh, the images coming through from the Soho uh, satellite and the uh, there's also um, uh, another probe called I think it's called Impactor no that's not it there's another probe anyway that's um, uh, getting in very very close to uh, um, to the Sun I'm just trying to remember its name it's it's um, it's on one, it's on a, a kind of um, an elliptical type orbit uh, and uh, polar type orbit, so it's designed to, uh, to to be capturing images from the north and south poles of the sun, and um, it's uh, occasionally comes in very very close to uh, 
uh, to uh, to the sun where it's, it is getting some amazing detailed images. I actually played that footage that you're probably talking about um, uh, over the last, it might have been last week or the week before, um, I showed some uh, exceptionally uh, amazing footage. In fact, I, I saw some footage um, uh, just today too, um, pro- probably the one that you're t- referring to on Facebook that's kicking around at the moment. So uh, it's... Um, you know, it's it's getting there. I've I, I don't know for a long time. I've been wanting to see the surface of the sun, the the actual physical flames you know, that make up the the uh, the surface, and uh, we're getting ever and ever closer to uh, to seeing that kind of detail. Uh, so uh, when I uh, get HT uh, up and running again on on RTV, you'll uh, you'll get a chance to to see it in, in full HD. Well, I mean, anybody looking on YouTube will be able to see that. <laughs> or NASA, getting to NASA. Thanks, Graham. Um, I may or may not stick around, but if it's just for a short, uh, a couple of words afterwards, I, I suppose I can. Um, thanks, Graham. Uh, cross to Greg, VK3 Delta X ray. G'day, Greg, VK3 EKH. Thanks, Greg. VK3 Delta X-ray, VK3 uh, EKH uh, returning. You're uh, a very good signal here too, 20, uh, uh, 20 plus uh, over nine. So it's it's um, uh, quite loud and clear. <laughs> and uh, it's interesting to uh, for your report there about uh, not making much difference when I turn the, the valves off. Um, <laughs> well, there you go. Um, all right. Yeah, thanks for the report. And... Um, uh, I, I, yes, I, I agree. Uh, like I say, the uh, some of the images uh, coming in from uh, the the probes that are studying the the sun is just uh, outstanding. Really, is outstanding. A lot of the images are are, are sped up in uh, motion because a lot of it um, uh, is taken. Uh, um, if you look at it in real time, uh, the, the motion is is a, a little, you know, takes uh, some of these massive uh, sun flares and bursts are often take um, minutes or, or um, uh, you know maybe even up to an hour to develop the way it does. So a lot of the flares that we see in these uh, video um, animated to type um, video footage is uh, sped up a little bit to dramatise the the effect so that we can see things happening quickly often the case um all right thanks greg uh don vk3 hdx vk3 ekh g'day mate what's wrong sorry go, go ahead creation group vk3 hdx good evening all good signal for everyone tonight um uh, listen uh on both a on 160 160 great on am clint love it <laughs> through the high places from here um really interesting broadcast tonight lots of uh, good articles and you have to concur with everybody the footage we're getting today is just uh, of the fun it's just incredible makes you really wonder what we're going to get to see in our uh, in our lifetime anyway you've got a, a few to get through so uh, thanks for the broadcast and we'll see you again next week ek3 ekh and we ek3 hdx yeah, thanks, Don. VK3HDX, VK3EKH. Thank you for the uh, email as well, the uh, email reports that you, you send all the time. And um, <coughs> um, and um, uh, and I'm just pleased that the uh, the AM signal on uh, on 160 uh, does uh, come across uh, uh, so well. So um, I'm very pleased to uh, to hear that. 
Thanks, Don. Um, I'll get my. Um, it's not quite in shot, but the uh, the NN uh, eight thousand is uh, up here, <laughs> up up there somewhere. And I've got to try and bring it down so I can really start to to get to use it. Anyway, that's uh, an old scratch record. That one's in it. Thanks, Don. Uh, Jack in Shepparton, VK3 TJS, VK3 EKH. G'day, Jack. Oh, thanks, Jack. VK3 TJS, VK3 EKH returning. Very good indeed. Yeah, just check the temperature here. It's uh, not uh, not super cold. It's about 10 degrees here in, in Narry Warren. So um, uh, it's actually been uh, not a too bad team. Um, it hasn't, uh, not as cold as it's been in the last few, few days. So um, you could actually do things outside today. Anyway, thanks, Jack. Good signal from you too. You're all, everybody seems to be hovering around 20 over 9, so uh, not doing too bad at all. Now, I, I've messed up my uh, call signs here a bit, so I'm not too sure exactly who follows. I know Andrew's there, VK3KIS, uh, but there's probably one or two stations I stuffed up on the call signs, so I'm not sure who else there is. I'm, I'm going to go straight to Andrew since I've got his call sign on my, my note here. So you, you have a say, Andrew, VK3KIS, Kilo India Sierra. Uh, VK3 EKH. Thanks, Andrew. VK3KIS, VK3EKH. Just a little tricky to hear. Didn't uh, the, the signal's good? You, you're basically five and nine and peaking around ten. Bit of QSB, uh, peaking around ten. Uh, but uh, I think the uh, perhaps the audio process is just a little bit on the too harsh side. Uh, perhaps a little bit on the too 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 harsh side. Um, occasionally, it was just a little bit hard to catch. Uh, uh, everything you were saying there, but um, uh, note that you were um, talking about an article or something that you, you saw uh, that would be of interest, uh, perhaps to to read out over the broadcast. So, uh, and I know that you've sent me uh, articles in the past. So, if you do find that um, uh, information, yeah, whether it's a video or an article, I'm not too sure. Uh, but uh, certainly send us the link if you do find it. Send us the link, and uh, we'll see if we can uh, perhaps uh, read it out over. Um, um, following broadcasts perhaps but um, never mind uh, anyway we, we're definitely hearing you here like I say you, you're 5 and 9 and hovering around 10 over but there's a little bit of QSB on your signal and perhaps that process is just a little bit on the too harsh side maybe perhaps um, thanks Andrew now I don't know if there's any other stations I'm going to quickly call in any other stations that uh, I haven't mentioned yet so this is VK3 EKH
Okay, go ahead, Frank. VK three J R uh, VK three and acknowledging uh, Martin VK three J R VK three E K H. Yeah, thanks, Frank. <coughs> oh, sorry about that. VK3JR, VK3EKH returning. Very good. Yes, say, say good day to Steve for us. Um, I uh, I often pick up the, the late night program. Not, uh, not I don't listen in right through because <laughs> I'm usually go downstairs after this. Uh, but by the time I head upstairs and uh, to um, head to the shack uh, or head to the to hit hit the sack, uh, I often listen to the tail end of the uh, the um, the later sessions that occur on on 1865. Um, <laughs> if that's what if that's what you're referring to. <laughs> Thanks, Frank. Good on you, mate. Uh, Martin, VK7JAH. Have a say, mate. VK3EKH. Good on you, Martin. VK7JH in uh, Launceston there. VK3EKH returning. Thanks, Martin. You're 5 and 9, right on the 9, right on the S9. And uh, I tell you, that noise floor, uh, that noise interfering signal is still there on 3541. Normally, it's um, it doesn't interfere with me here on a Friday night, but um, <clears throat> I have noticed it. <clears throat> I have noticed it from time to time. There'll be a, um, a spot. Something that just produces a um, a spot of noise on three five four one, which is twenty over nine, and uh, it's there right now. So uh, what a pain! I'm not sure what's uh, doing that, but uh, I wish it would go away. <laughs> anyway, thanks, Martin. Good on you. Thanks for coming up on the chat window there too, and uh, saying good day to everybody. Um, all right, I'll take one more listen. VK three EKH. Uh, what well, you hit what well, on um, on four one? Yeah, no, I, I would say that it's pretty local. Um, I'm pretty sure it's local. Uh, it's uh, it's. Um, I mean, I don't know whether my sniffer uh, would be able to uh, to pick it up. Uh, the, the last time I tried to uh, to locate noise like that, I uh, well, it was out in the street. It, it did peak around a, a one of the lampposts. Um, and uh, that's I think was directly related to the new LED lighting over the uh, over the um, the intersection here. But uh, this this is uh, a slightly different kind of noise. It's it's it sounds like like a battery charge. You know the sort of noise that comes from a, a charging circuit um, for a, for a battery or something. So uh, I don't know. I'm not sure. Hopefully uh, it won't be there next week. <laughs> Thanks, Tony. Um, hopefully we'll catch up with you tomorrow too. Um, okay, if there's uh, nobody else, we'll uh, go QRT. VK3EKH taking one more listen on, on 3545. Yeah, thanks, Frank. Um, I'm just going to say good day to Steve. Uh, thanks, Steve. Thanks, everyone. It's been uh, a good night. It's been a very rushed one hour, I must admit. I felt like I was going through some of those articles uh, uh, too fast. I have to remember to slow down. This is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria. 
concluding transmission for tonight. Uh, thank you for watching on YouTube. For the, everybody else that uh, will catch up on the YouTube stream later in the week, for those to, that do, um, that are, you know, just send us a uh, report, um, vk3ekh at gmail.com, and it uh, be nice to uh, to see who, who those uh, 20 people are that actually... Um, watch this mess uh so there it is um and um um i might give uh, uh vk3 aml a bit of a plug saturday every saturday night chris vk3 alpha um mike lima has a youtube session that runs for an hour so all i can say about uh, the session is to if you're not doing anything at 9.30 uh, on a Saturday night, uh, go to YouTube, type in VK3AML, VK3 Alpha uh, Mike Lima, and uh, sit in on his uh, his YouTube channel. He's also broadcasting on 2 meters uh, as well, um, on 147.475, uh, but he has a most entertaining uh, educational session for a couple of hours. He often finishes around 11.30, 12 o'clock with a bit of a talkback session on two meters uh, with the local lads. Uh, but uh, Chris has a very in incredibly very educational material that he, he uh, runs over his program and uh, using a 4K camera on his YouTube channel. It's uh, most exceedingly uh, educational and interesting what, uh, what Chris does and prepares for every Saturday night. So uh, there's a bit of a plug for you there, Chris, if you're listening. <laughs> um, with that, this is VK3EKH on behalf of the Astronomical Society of Victoria concluding transmissions tonight, and uh, we'll see you all next week. Have a safe weekend and uh, stay warm. This is VK3EKH. Oh, all right, let me finish on YouTube. Okay, cheers, everyone, watching YouTube. Thanks for... Uh, the uh for watching and we'll like i said we'll be back again next week to do it all again so uh we shall conclude the youtube stream bye everyone